I want to talk a little bit about atomic tests before we actually dive into this exercise. Atomic test simply means testing one thing, testing a single feature, validating that a single functionality is working. You know you have an atomic test when you have one assertion in your test. Maybe two assertions may be needed if you need to set up a state of an atomic test and validate that the state is that the atomic test is in the correct state before proceeding. So maybe two assertions at most are needed, but you should never have three or more assertions, also known as validations, in your tests because that means that they will not be atomic. And it's funny because the more I work with the test automation, the more years that I put into this, the more that I work with clients, the more tests that I debug, the more uh, students that I teach, the more I start to believe that atomic testing in terms of GUI automation is one of the most powerful things that we can do to cure all test automation problems, such as flakiness, such as uh, slow, slow response time, such as slow feedback from the test, having atomic testing pretty much cures all of it because just by creating atomic tests, we have to overcome all of these different barriers that we normally encounter in test automation. So if you've been sleeping the whole time, haven't been listening to my presentation at all, I hope that at this point you really pay attention because if you can achieve automicity in tests, I am 100% sure that your tests will be fast, they will be flake free, they will be extremely stable, robust, and you will get amazing feedback from your test automation and it will produce amazing results for you and your company that you work for. So this here is not an atomic test. This is actually the test that we were looking at uh, in Java and we also that that was the very original point that I wanted to make with that full long end-to-end -end journey test that test was not atomic it was validating way too much and so for example here you can see all of the validations that are occurring on for example on line 25 line 31 and so on and so forth this is a problem because whenever something fails on line 25 line 31 or line 33 or any other code afterwards will never be validated. And so if you were trying to increase your test coverage, you're actually going to be losing it because when your test fails prematurely, you will not have certain features covered because uh, they won't be executed in that test. And so that's one of the biggest problems. The other problem is that with UI automation, it just tends to be standard that the more Selenium commands we have, the less stable our tests become. Because think, every single Selenium command is a chance for invalid element locator and improper synchronization technique for something to go wrong, right? Maybe there's some JavaScript that executes that throws off your script. So there are so many things that can go wrong. And so the more Selenium commands that you stack in your test, the more likely it is to fail. And so again, once it fails, it will produce you invalid results. People will stop trusting your test automation and you could even lose test coverage because if there's more automation to be done after in that test and it failed prematurely, then you will lose test coverage. So that's why we want to avoid non-atomic tests. Here's an example of how we create an atomic test, right? So that end-to-end -end test that we saw here, uh, which uh, the very first step on line number 25 was it was opening a login page and then it was validating that the login page is loaded. So rather than having that in a massive end-to-end -end test, we extract that into its own tiny singular atomic test that will, and that as the test reads, a login page should load. So when a login page should load test fails, we know exactly why the test failed. It could really be only a few things. Either the login page did not load or your application failed to just render at all, right? Maybe you, you try to hit the URL and you get a 400 error status code, in which case all of your tests will fail. So 
th this test can only fail for one reason, which is really awesome because when it fails, you know that oh oh login failed and I need to check to see why it failed and what is the bug there. And by the way, remember from our beginning, we would never, almost never ever automate a login test through the UI because we can do that at the unit or the API layer. Um, that is the best place to do it. Of course, we can start at the UI layer sometimes because we don't know that we can do it at the lower layers, but at some point we should move it to the unit and the API layer because that's just way more efficient, way less code, way more stable. So why wouldn't you do it there? Just as a side note to bring you back all the way to the beginning. But again, this is just an example that I'm showing you to get the points across simply because we're so familiar with the login features. So at this point, of course, in your head, you might be wondering, okay, well, how do I tackle end-to-end -end tests, right? End-to-end -end test, the way I'm going to describe it and the way I think most of us talk about an end-to-end -end test is it means a test that's going from screen to screen, from screen, one screen to the next screen to the next screen, maybe 20 screens, maybe 100 screens long. And really, let's say on the 20th screen, we're validating that some part of that screen as working as expected. But we need the other 19 screens to set up the state for that 20th screen to be able to function as extent as expected. Okay, so I want to clarify that because end to end tests are at uh, the end to end test term is so loaded really for developers, for example, an end to end test simply means a test that checks from the database all the way to the HTML. So in our case, we can have an end to end test as a developer, we can have an end to end test that loads a page and checks one feature, it's an atomic test, and that's it, that's an end-to-end -end test for us, because we checked, oh yes, it's connected to the database, the API is working, and the H and the uh, UI is also working, and they're all working together, that's for us an end-to-end -end test. So I wanna talk about it in terms of uh, testing end-to-end -end tests, meaning screen-to-screen, -screen, okay? Sidetrack, but I had to clarify that. So. Again, we, we try to figure out how can we automate those, right? Because we need 19 screens to set up the 20th screen so that we can test it. How do we do that? Well, there are actually at least four ways that we can do that. We can do that through JavaScript by injecting JavaScript into our browser. We can do that through RESTful APIs, which is the best, most reliable way because that is how our applications will usually behave. And we can use the APIs to mimic what our applications do. Uh, we can do it through the database and we can also do it through cookies. And I'm gonna show you pretty much all of those mechanisms. However, ultimately, before we jump into those mechanisms, it all boils down to seams and testability. Our applications must be testable. Now, as they must be testable for the unit tests, right? I don't know if you ever heard the idea that to be able to write unit tests, our application needs to be testable, which means that it needs to have interfaces that we can mock so that we can mock different kinds of behaviors so that then we can assert on the functionality that we really only care about and not assert on anything else. The same thing applies to our UI testing. In fact, all concepts that apply to unit and integration testing apply to UI testing. It's just they're pretty new in UI testing because we're all automation engineers, we're not developers, and so we're kind of relearning all the stuff that they've all, all the developers already know. And so testability just means that we need to be able to control the state of our application so that we can remove all the stuff that's irrelevant to a feature, test only the feature that we want in the UI, and be done with it. The, for And we'll go through some of these examples right now. Here, I recorded a video using a web API with Amazon. I'm sure we're all familiar with the massive Amazon. Let's take a look at this video here. So what you'll see here is right now I'm performing a manual test, right? This is the manual scenario that we'll automate. We're gonna go to amazon.com and then I'm just gonna go ahead and sign in. So here you can see we're signing into our Amazon account. And so now that we are signed in, we are going to search for an item. 
So here we're searching for an automation testing book. Also pay attention to the URL on top. Notice how it gets populated with different types of parameters. We found our book. We're checking how many items that are in the cart. We're going to add the book to the cart and make sure that the uh, cart was increased by the appropriate number of add to cart. So that was ultimately what we were testing. Can we search for an item and can we add an item to a cart, right? That's the test case. So here I'm going back and I'm copying the URL and I'm restarting. So if we were using Selenium, all we would really have to do is paste this URL or this is simply a web request. This is a HTTP request and you can see that the API of Amazon has these query string parameters that tell the Amazon application what to display in the UI. And we all, well, I shouldn't say all, a lot of us have these APIs available. A lot of our applications function using such APIs to perform these behaviors. Some of us are not so lucky to do so, but other, others of us are. So if we have such an API, what that means is ultimately I could have, if I wanted to simulate it in a test, just perform a simple web request, not using Selenium, not using anything, just use a simple HTTP, uh, HTTP client, perform the web request, open up to that exact URL page with the book, and then Selenium can enter, click the button, and make sure that the cart was updated with the appropriate amount of items. That is all that's relevant. It's not relevant whether you can log in. It's not relevant where you can search for a book or find the book. We're trying to test that you can add an item to a cart. If you want to test if you can log in, that's a totally separate atomic test case. If you want to test whether you want whether you can search for a book, that's a totally separate atomic test case. You put all of them together, they create your end-to-end -end scenario, but they can run all independently in parallel and get all the beautiful advantages that atomic tests give us. So, also my question was, how did we log in the second time, right? Did you see I went back and then I copied the URL and then I hit the URL, but I didn't need to log in. That's because in this case, Amazon, for example, drops cookies on our browser that let Amazon know that there's a session uh, that has been tied to this user and this user can now access Amazon with the session and perform these operations. You can do the exact same thing, right? You can drop a cookie. Selenium allows us to drop cookies on our browser. So in this case, what we could have done is if we wanted to test the login and then to make sure that a user can search for an item, all you have to do is drop a cookie in the browser make sure that will log in the user and then just simply search for an item. And now you can use Selenium to search for an item and make sure that the user can find the item as they want. The third way that I talked about, uh, if you don't have an API available, if you can't drop cookies, you can also perform database manipulations, right? These are very common. For example, the API normally should do all of this stuff. And if your team doesn't provide this to you, you need to work towards it. Ultimately, everybody wants some API available to manipulate data and states of application. It's really nice. But if you don't, you can just do straight up data manipulations in the database. So for example, let's say you want a female that is 45 years old with two children and makes $50,000 a month. You can create a user in the database, utilize that user for your test case, um, log in with that user, for example, and then that will open up the page that you want in a certain state, and then perform the operations that you want with Selenium or Appium, and then uh, kill your test, and then destroy the user so that you're always cleaning up the database. And the fourth piece that I wanted to talk about is JavaScript injections. And I'll actually show you that live with our application. Now, one thing I want to do before that is mention that, no, it will not be easy. As you can see here, it's not easy being a fat cat. It's also not achie easy achieving atomic tests. If it was so easy, a lot of us would have it, but we don't. And that's why I think it's so powerful because as you work towards achieving atomic tests, you will overcome so many challenges such as 
creating a nice API for your application so that everybody can interact and easily abstract out and mock out all the information that is irrelevant to your tests. Um, you'll be able to cross the team boundaries, talk to your developers, have them working with you to create a testable application. A lot of times developers don't know what it means to create a testable application for UI automation because they've never done it. They may know what it means to create a testable application for unit testing because they're doing it, but they're not maybe they're not doing API testing and UI testing. So they don't know what you need. So we have to, as engineers, go to them and let them know, hey, look, I'm facing this problem. I am having to log in to my application every single time. It's costing me a minute in test automation time, and it's also pretty flaky. How can I bypass this process? Is there, can I possibly drop a cookie or maybe can I uh, have some session ID that I can create? Can I create some token through an API, something like that? Just have a conversation with them. Let them know the problem and they will give you the solution. And then you can try the solution and come back to them and let them know if it works or not. I have never had an issue getting a developer to help me overcome my challenges. Every time I give these kinds of presentations, I always ask if anyone else has had issues and nobody has had issues with developers helping them out. They're friendly people. We're all working towards a common goal. Let's just go approach them, talk to them and make our applications better.